Hail to the conquering hero. Spectrum Hawaii pays tribute to Olympic world champion swimmer and island surfer, Duke Kahanamoku. But first, a hero of the keyboard. To his many faithful piano students, Ernest Chang is a paragon of poise, discipline, and discernment. He teaches that happiness can be expressed. Hi, Sean. Hi, Mr. Chang. Come on in. Hi, Carol. Hi. Come in. How are you today? Fine. Good. You look happy. Did you have a good lunch? Yeah. What did you have for lunch? Pork fried rice. Oh, my. That sounds delicious. OK. How was the practicing this week? Good. Have you practiced every day? Yeah. Good, good. What shall we work on first? You want to start with Bach? Okay. Bach, Musette, and D major, right? Okay. Studying the piano, you learn many, many things about yourself, about life, and uh, gain many skills that you can apply to other areas in your life. Like, for example, when you study the piano, it takes a great deal of discipline. It takes a great deal of self-control. It's necessarily also a lonely type of a business because you spend many, many hours practicing by yourself. So you have to learn to live with yourself. Again, you have to achieve a bigger contrast between the loud part here and the soft part over here, OK? Just pretend there's a party going on next door, OK? And lots of people, and they're having a lot of fun, and they're making a lot of noise. So when you open up your door, you hear all of this noise there, OK? And when you close the door, like on this part over here, it's very soft. And then you open up the door again over there, and then you have soft part, you close the door, OK? All right? Those who so teach piano can different find different themselves the absorbed part, in their work. Ernest Chang teaches from, piano in his here. studio in Honolulu. Says, he finds it fulfilling. Okay. Here we go, here we go. It's not necessarily like piano teaching is an occupation or it's a job, you might say. Um, it, it's how I live, how I breathe. It's my everyday life, every day of the year. A piano teacher's relationship to his or her student is a very special one. A piano teacher or a music teacher is more of the one-on-one -on -one type of situation. And this relationship is sort of a long-term relationship, lasting for five to 10 or even more years. So as a piano teacher, you become not only a source of information and inspiration, authority, but you become also a friend or even a part of the family. Chang studied piano at the Juilliard School in New York. For five years, his teacher was Madame Adele Marcus, who has taught a number of pianists now playing on the concert stage. As distinguished a person as she was, with such a great reputation, and in such demand from people who were clamoring to study with her, she was yet 
very, very devoted and dedicated to all of her students. She gave Chang a special gift of appreciation. I always felt that whenever I learned to play a piece that she taught me, that I could play it better than anyone else. Now Chang shares this gift with his own students here in Hawaii. There are several schools of thought about how to teach piano. Like there's the old European school with a very prescribed curriculum and very set grade levels and examinations after each grade level. It's very uh, rigid, very rigid sort of uh, course of study. But Chang disagrees. I try to gear the course of study toward the individuality of the student rather than try to mold the student to the course of study. From a vast selection of music, he will choose specific pieces to achieve certain learning skills. For example, you, if you want to develop their strength and their sound, you might give them something that's chordal and heavy. Uh, like a Chopin Polonaise. Or if you wanted to develop expressiveness, well, then you would give them a nocturne. Or if you wanted to develop a certain kind of finger technique, well, then maybe a more classical sonata. The mechanical aspect of playing is stressed. Fingering, pedaling, the use of the entire body is not ignored but the soul of the written score comes to life from the pianist's own expressiveness. so calculated on this part try and make it sound a little bit more uh, like waterfall okay or fountains okay start it slow and then just rush up toward the top a little bit more okay one and a go and then again up Nice lyrical feeling on this piece now. What type of emotion are you trying to express? Are you trying to express sadness? Are you trying to express the feeling of happiness, patriotism? Uh, and even when you're talking about happiness, what type of happiness are you trying to express? Students like Judy are learning for their own enjoyment. Others, like five year old Nikki and eight year old Sean, are learning as a part of growing up. Those like Susan strive for a possible career as a concert pianist. As a child of seven in Korea, 
Akiko Takahashi decided to be a concert pianist. When she and her family moved to Hawaii several years later, she began her studies with Ernest Chang. She remembers the choices she had to make as an aspiring musician. I didn't have time to do a whole lot of frivolous playing. When everybody was out there, you know, playing tennis or something, I was, I had to practice. Um, so in one sense, it gave me a very serious outlook um, as to what life is all about. You became focused all of a sudden. You know, it's like from the day of age seven, this is what you were going to be. And I never thought about anything else. For personal reasons, she relinquished her dreams at 19 and is now the director of training at a Waikiki hotel. She attributes her years of piano study to the development of skills she uses in her present career. When I'm doing training or when I'm giving a speech, I think about the time that I had to get on that stage and perform the Rhapsody in Blue or something, and I say, you know, if you could do the Rhapsody in Blue, you could certainly go out there and speak for 15 minutes. Ready? And one. I recommend music to um, anyone, regardless of their age. Music adds creativity. It provides intensity to whatever you do. When you play music, it's a feeling, and you're, you're concerned all the time with the intensity to express things. Um, and when you do that with music, you intend to do that with your life, and I think that's very important. That's right, that's right. Okay, now you see, what happens over here? It's not stationary anymore. It reaches up to... Duke Paoa Kahanamoku, better known as the Duke, is still regarded today as one of the world's greatest aquatic sportsmen of all time. Participant in five Olympic Games dating back to his gold medal performance in the 1912 competition in Stockholm, Sweden, this quiet-mannered, muscular Hawaiian beach boy from Waikiki captured the hearts and respect of countless generations of admirers from around the globe. The Duke taught us all the meaning of brotherhood and love. the many fans from around the globe, no stronger group exists than those who have grown up in Duke's own backyard here in Hawaii. I remember when I was a kid, Duke used to come out all the time just to go out for a paddle or take a swim by himself. It was mostly just to be alone, I think, with his thoughts in the ocean. He had this lifelong relationship with the ocean. It was quite unique, I think, for modern Hawaii, but quite natural to do. Tukanamoku was my neighbor. Uh, we lived in the duck ponds about approximately 100 acres, all in swamps, with a series of date trees planted. Originally, that area was scheduled to be a date farm. It was supposed to be commercial. That location was on Corner McCulley and Kalakau Avenue. And there was a streetcar that turns right smack at the corner. And I, we lived about two blocks away from Tukahanamoku. Yeah, he was living on the Paoa property, uh, which they were related to. And Tukahanamoku was a very humble person and very, what I would call, a first-class Hawaiian. Growing up with my famous brother, the whole family never took advantage of the name. 
I never have. I'm 76 today, proud of it, because we kept it clean. I came from a beautiful parents, mother and father. Uh, my mother came from the island of Kauai. She was the daughter of the high chief there. My father came from, I think it was Maui, Hawaii. And uh, they were great parents, great parents. So they had 14 youngsters. I'm the 14th. I only knew six boys and three girls, but some died before Brother Duke and after. So the ones that lived through my life, that was Brother Duke, David, Bernice, uh, Bill, who we lost yesterday, Samuel, Capiolani, Mariah, Louis, and myself. My brother Louis is over in the corner. My sister Bernice is in uh, Hilo. Well, when I grew up, yes, my brother Duke was the eldest, and I always had to listen, up to, him, listen to him. I always looked up to him. I came over here in the December 1938. I didn't meet Duke until about a month or so afterwards. I was introduced to him by his brother, Sam. But I wanted to meet Duke because I had read about him when I was a little girl in school. I would read about him in a movie magazine where he had been discovered by Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. When I heard the name Duke Kahanamoku, of course, I couldn't pronounce it then. I had no idea how to pronounce it. I said, that's the man I want to meet. Well, I think I met all of his five brothers first. And little by little, I met Duke. And it was love at first sight for Duke, which was very lucky for me. There was one experience. Uh... Well, we, um, we boarded from here to Maui, overnight in Maui, and from Maui to the big island, uh, the channel known as uh, Alanui Haha Channel. You know, supposedly one of the roughest channels in the world when it's, really, when it's real bad, and uh, um, there were four of us. I mean, we were hanging on, trying to you know, stay in the boat as, uh, as much as we can because it was so rough. And, and Duke was just standing there like nothing was phasing him, you know? And he turned to us and said, what's the matter, boy? It's too rough for you, you know? And, uh, but I tell you, that was a day I, I thought we were, uh, you know, going to see the end of, uh, end of uh, Hawaii. <laughs> it, was a, it was a scary experience, but Duke was very, um, you know, in control and, and didn't face him at all. Ralph Edwards uh, contacted me here in Hawaii and said that he was going to ask Duke to appear on This Is Your Life, but it had to be very secretive. Nobody was supposed to know, only the people concerned. And it had to keep it a dark, dark secret. He asked all the rest of his family. They were all living then in 19... 57. So we all kept silent and we went over to the mainland separately so that nobody would suspect anything. Duke especially wouldn't suspect anything. So you got him over there supposedly on a business trip and Ralph called him and said, I'd like to have you come on the um, stage to see this set that we have of a Hawaiian village and see if you approve of it. That was the way he lured him onto the stage. Hello, how are you? Nice seeing you. Good, you know the Duke. Oh, Duke Kahanamoka. Duke Kahanamoka. Good to see you. Duke, last time I saw you in Hawaii. So Duke goes on and looks at this Hawaiian village and said, well, it looks all right or whatever. And then Ralph, pounced on him and handed him the book because and said, Duke, Duke this is your life. Famous champion Olympic swimmer oh, and Honolulu. sheriff of Honolulu, Hawaii, tonight, this is your life. Yeah. <laughs> Let's tell the story, ladies and gentlemen, of a little Hawaiian boy who became the most famous swimmer in the world, participated in five Olympic games, and used his great speed and power in a most heroic way. So one day he was on the beach with some people sitting and there was this cruiser going out, people going fishing. I don't know whether you remember this or not, but he uh, was on the beach. 
standing up there, and these people that he was with on the beach, on the beach he's kind of worried about him. What he was, you know, what's, what's up to? He never said a word. But he had the feeling that that boat was going to capsize because they were in the wrong lane. They was too close, just, just be, within the reef and the wave. Sure enough, there we go. So he, what does he do? He takes his surfboard, he paddles out there, he brings one in, he brings two in, he brings three. When I get the fourth in, the fourth was all tangled up in the net. This is what I, I was told. And he couldn't, couldn't get that guy there. He was so mad, he was sad about it, but he got the other. I think he saved seven lives that day, or six, all by himself. And there's one thing about my brother, which I always loved, never will forget, because he was a great man. He had never sat around and wait for the reporters. He just went to sleep. He told, you know, like, well, let somebody else tell it all about him, about him. You know, this is the, he, people were, the reporters, well, what happened here on the beach? And Duke is like that till the day he died. You see, he tried to do what's right for the people, and he loved people. I want to thank you again for the rescuing me and saving my life. I do not think anybody can measure up to Duke's personality. He had a tremendous personality and a tremendous warmth and always meeting people and giving the regular aloha spirit. And that, in my estimation, is the not as a, only as a swimmer, but on account of his personality that made him so famous. The name Duke was handed down to you from your daddy. That's right. Where do your brothers and sisters live, Duke? Well, they're all in uh, Honolulu. They are. <laughs> they're here in Hollywood to help us tell your story. Here's Bernice, sister Bernice, Kapiolani, off. Oh, thank you, Kapiolani. <laughs> you betcha. This is David, right? Hey, man. Hey, here's brother. Bill. Oh. Here's Sam, oh, right here. Really and here's Louie. Oh. Hey, Louie. And here is Sarge. <laughs> hey, your lovely wife, Nadine Kahanamoku. <laughs> here's Nadine. <laughs> but his favorite meal, his number one favorite food, was poi, a big bowl of poi, and a can of salmon, chilled. Open the can and get an onion, and quarter the onion, and the big bowl of poi, and that was his favorite meal, period. His second favorite was um, Argentine canned corned beef fried with onions. And again, a great big bowl of poi. Well, when I say a big bowl, I mean a big bowl like that. And those were his two favorites. But I started out with French cooking and trying to have all these different sauces and be very lovely. And he'd say, baby, where's the ketchup? He always called me baby. He said, where's the ketchup? And I said, you can't put ketchup on that. That's a hollandaise sauce or a, a, you know, sauce bernaise, whatever. Well, I like ketchup. Then finally he got to the point and he said, baby, just cook it plain. Everything Duke did athletically was championship performance. Uh, his surfing ability, uh, he was way beyond his time. Uh, some of the things he did with, with a surfboard were, uh, were profound in their day. Uh, considering also the equipment he was working with. When Duke was surfing as a young man in the earlier part of this century, he was surfing on surfboards that were 15 or 16 feet long and weighed 120 or 130 pounds. Uh, I'd venture to say that many kids nowadays couldn't even carry Duke's board to the water, much less surf it. Uh, this is kind of a big wave now. Come up this way. Take your feet up that way. That way. Go, let go. Balance, balance, balance. Move up. The wave, small, go forward. The way big, you go back. And when you get back, you want to turn right, you just go. And that whole thing turns. You want to go left, you go. And all the, all the, it's right in here. Duke right in there. was so humble that he prevailed on me to be humble and be kind also. Uh, he was a man of tremendous stature, but very humble and, and down to earth. 
it was a real, real quality. Uh, but among the Hawaiians, uh, it was a quality of unusual strength. The only man who could have uh, defeated you, your former opponent and now close friend, the man who himself broke the established world record, Johnny Weinkiller. Do you recognize him now that he's Jungle Jim? Boy, he is. Oh, the kids love this guy. Duke actually uh, helped you to beat him, didn't he, Johnny? Yes, he did. You know, we trained together in the Olympic Games. Yes. And this big lug, he just gave me all the confidence in the world. Wow, this is a thrill. Contemporary people, especially contemporary young people, to realize is that, uh, that this name they hear, Duke Kahanamoku, was a real man. And it, he was a man uh, that gained his respect and, uh, and his honor uh, in our society uh, through just being a good man and not uh, not through uh, being a capitalist or being a big businessman or being, but being a, a talented, devoted, uh, wonderful man. He was, uh, in my estimation, uh, the embodiment of Aloha. He, he always, uh, you know, Duke was the type of person who, who might have felt, uh, uh, had ill feelings about a subject or someone, but he never, he never let you know about it. Uh, the guy always had a smile on his face and always a good word uh, for, for everybody he met. And, uh, he was not caught up in the uh, modern day-to-day -day rat race that seems to consume uh, so many people nowadays. He had, a, as I said earlier, a great sense of value in life. Uh, he valued those things that, that money can neither buy nor destroy to a certain extent. He valued human relationships. He valued his relationship with the ocean and uh, with his lifestyle, with his ability to, to play in the ocean. And uh, uh, these attributes, I think, are very special.